Welcome to Kluge Book Conversations. I'm Dean Torello. I lead chair programs at the Kluge Center at the Library of Congress. And I'm here today with Bruce Clark uh, and Sebastian Dutre. Uh, Bruce is the Paul Whitfield Horn Distinguished Professor of Literature and Science at Texas Tech University. He was the Barrick Blumberg NASA Library of Congress Chair in Astrobiology at the uh, Kluge Center. And it was during this time that he was researching the book that we are discussing today. The book's title is Writing Gaia, the Scientific Correspondence of James Lovelock and Lynn, Lynn Margulis. And it was published by Cambridge University Press just a couple months ago. Uh, we are joined by uh, Bruce's co-editor, Sebastien Dutre, who is the CNRS researcher in history and philosophy of science at Aix-Marseille Université. Bruce, Seb, thanks so much for being with us today. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Good to see you again. So I'm thinking we could start with a, a very high level overview. Uh, the book deals with the correspondence on, on Gaia. When I hear the, the word Gaia, it evokes classical imagery. It evokes imagery from, so from a certain historical time period, perhaps in the 70s. Uh, I wonder if you could give us a very high level overview. What is Gaia theory and how did this, uh, how did the naming come about? Well, I'll jump in uh, to, uh, uh, to field those questions uh, because they're, they're very common. And, and, but I think a, a high level way to begin is just to acknowledge the brilliance of naming this what is a straightforward scientific hypothesis regarding the interrelation between uh, life on Earth and, and its geological setting uh, after a, uh, a classical, oh, uh, uh, right, after Gaia, the uh, archaic goddess of the Earth. Uh, because it, it gave the theory a kind of profile beyond science that was, that, that was not always helpful for the science, but nevertheless uh, 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 brought the idea out much wider than it would have gone, I think, uh, uh, if it had just had some drab uh, uh, name, uh, or, or, or just some title. Um, but it began as the Gaia hypothesis. That's the thing. Uh, one thing is important. It began, uh, Gaia theory follows a, a decade or a couple decades later, but at the very beginning, it was simply a hypothesis, a surmise that there was an anomaly that uh, a, a way of possibly explaining the anomaly of the Earth's atmosphere, uh, that it's so far from thermodynamic equi equilibrium, but it's full of uh, reducing gases that ought to combine and burn each other out, but they keep, uh, and so one realizes, and, and over the geological long, long haul, they seem to be stable in their proportions over hundreds of millions, if not billions of years. And so it was Lovelock who was the first to think, well, this is a problem. <laughs> How can this be? Uh, it seems like something is regulating the, uh, 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 there's some kind of feedback regime that's holding the atmosphere stable over geological time. Whatever that thing is, let's call it Gaia. <laughs> so that's a rough sketch of how it started, but the the the, the uh, but it was not Lovelock who came up with the name. This is a story that Lovelock loved to tell. It was his friend William Golding, a famous Nobel Prize winning British novelist, who uh, who was a neighbor of Lovelock's. Just I'm going to jump in for a second. Give us a quick. You mentioned Lovelock. Can you just give us a glimpse of who he was, where he lived, what was his story? Um, Seth, why don't you jump in and just give us a 
Seb is the Lovelock man in our team. <laughs> I'm the marvelous person. So why does okay. it? Yeah, yes, I might be, I might be the champion on this one. So the uh, Lovelock um, it was an English scientist uh, born in 1919. Uh, he was trained as a chemist and um, he spent, he, he first spent 20 years from 1940 to 1960. Uh, in um, doing biochemical work in a medical institute. So for 20 years, he's done work on um, the transmission of respiratory infections, such as the common cold, um, biochemical work, and also work in cryobiology, where he frees um, blood cells, spermatozoa, and uh, living hamsters. And out of this work in cryobiology, he had to measure minute um, concentrations of um, lipid um, uh, of the, the lipids of cells, and he happened to be at that time in the epicenter of um, chromatography, which was a new technique in uh, analytical chemistry, which enables to separate out the different compounds of a solution. And what chromatography was missing at that time was detectors to detect the molecule uh, after the chromatograph. And so Lovelock became the specialist of the invention of various detectors. And fam the most famous one was the electron capture detector. So at the end of the fifth, um, toward the end of the fifties, uh, Lovelock was the most uh, important international expert throughout the world for detecting minor concentration of molecules. And this opened up for him a whole new career where he settled up as a scientific consultant for various um, public institutions, but also private companies, uh, starting from the 1960s. And it is from within this context that he was invited uh, first by NASA to work at GPL uh, on chromatographs, which were to be uh, sent uh, on um, missions to explore the solar system, such as the moon or Mars. Uh, and so in the early 60s, he moved to the US working uh, at NASA and working at GPL. And for the following two decades in the 60s and 70s, he was working out, uh, he was working on new subjects like atmospheric chemistry, global pollution issues, and the development of the Gaia hypothesis in conjunction with uh, Lynn Margulis, which uh, whom he met uh, toward the late 60s. Wonderful. That, that's a that's a great overview. And and Bruno, yeah. you were right in the middle, you were right. in the middle well, of the story so, about Lindbach. So it it's the um so the NASA background is crucial. And of course, that's what connects to the Blumberg chair. Uh, that, that's what brings Gaia most directly into the purview of the promotion of astrobiology, which is the purpose of the chair that I had at the Library of Congress. So it's the application of, of his uh, inventions for exceedingly minute measurements of, of chemical concentrations uh, that he turns on the atmosphere and can now measure uh, with, with uh, uh, a whole uh, new level of accuracy uh, uh, the particles and, and, and the chemical components of the atmosphere. And so he puts that together with, with NASA observations on Venus and Mars and so where, where through spectrographic analysis, we can get a basic idea of their atmospheres. So that's where the anomaly comes in because both of those planets have essentially uh, reduced or uh, uh, the, 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 the chemical energy of those atmospheres is burnt out, okay? Uh, is and basically inert. And then you turn back to the earth and you go, the there's something is keeping the atmosphere of the earth uh, far from any kind of inert state. Uh, uh, and so it must be, it must be, I mean, it, you know, it seems clear enough, life must be having some profound effect on the earth's atmosphere. And as we were talking about, uh, seems to have held, you know, held matters at such a steady state over such a long period of time that that it's reasonable to think there's some kind of regulation taking place. So Gaia 
so essentially Gaia was the name for this regulating system uh, or regime. Uh, uh, but but Lovelock pointed out he did not have a classical university education. He really never studied Greek mythology uh, uh, himself. So when his friend uh, William Golding, who uh, who uh, Lovelock kind of explained his hypothesis to him as they were walking along this in this famous story, they're walking along and Lovelock. Just to be clear, this is this is William Golding of Lord of the Flies fame. That, that William Golding, that yes. William Golding, yes. Great. So uh, uh, they just happened to be neighbors and became friends and would take these walks together. Lovelock was a great walker all his life. And and he uh, so he was describing his hypothesis uh, that I've just sketched out to William Golding, and and so Golding says, well, uh, 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 such a uh, comprehensive theory about the Earth altogether sounds. Uh, I would give it. What do you think? Let's call it the Gaia hypothesis, and and they continued walking along. Uh, but uh, what Lovelock later revealed was when Golding said Gaia, he thought he heard him say Geyer, which would be the British pronunciation of G-Y-R-E. In American, we call it a gyre, right? He thought he said Geyer. And he said, well, that makes sense because a gyre is a fed back system, is a kind of swirl that builds upon itself. Right. And that was, you know, in, in roughly speaking, he could he could fit that into his Gaia idea. And finally, Golding said after uh, a while, Golding said, no, no, wait, you misheard me. I said Gaia, the ancient goddess of the earth. And, and he goes, oh. Gaia. Oh, OK, that sounds good. And 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 he he seized on that. And then when he began gradually having enough uh, uh, sort of a foundation for the hypothesis to begin to present it in, in uh, scientific publications, uh, uh, he, put, he put that name on it uh, and, and out into the world it went with, with a, a kind of, with a connotation of a kind of mythological resonance that it didn't really possess at the level of what the science was saying but that uh so that's that's one of the the origin stories of the gaia hypothesis that's a that's a wonderful story of somewhat accidental <laughs> naming which had a fortuitous uh afterlife so James Lovelock, of course, so this is a book of, of letters. You edited the letters, and James Lovelock is writing to Lynn Margulis. Uh, do you want to say a few words? Who was Lynn Margulis? Carl Sagan fits into the picture somehow. Tell us sure. a little bit about that. What, sure. Well, I'll pick, up, I'll pick up that story. Um, the, uh, now, we must say Margulis. Uh, that's, that's how Lynn pronounced her name, was Margulis. Uh, the, the name she took from her second husband, Carl Sagan, was her first husband. Uh, 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 and, and, and so Lynn Margulis was um, just a, a, a middle class uh, young woman from Chicago who was um, intellectually precocious and entered the uh, undergraduate program at the University of Chicago, which was a kind of famous lab uh, program. I, I don't mean scientific lab. I just, I, I mean, it was a, a comprehensive uh, program of humanistic and scientific education. Anyway, she, she matriculated at 15. And by the time she graduated at 19, she married Carl Sagan, who was about five years older. So she met Sagan uh, as he was in grad school. So they got married and then she followed Carl's uh, professional career. That is, he moved on to take his first set of professional positions uh, and Lynn, Lynn followed him. Then the other side of that, that uh, 
uh, Seb mentioned JPL, which is the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is a NASA lab in Pasadena, California. So Lovelock would sometimes be at the JPL doing his NASA work. And Carl Sagan would come through uh, on a case. So there, were, there was opportunity for them to, I think at some point they shared an office. I, I don't think it was for a, a lengthy period of time, but they got to know each other. And so um, uh, uh, at a certain point, uh, Margulis had conceived research questions about the contributions of living processes to the atmosphere. And she asked her ex-husband, Carl Sagan, because this was already in the late, this would have been in 1969 or 70, who, who should I talk to? Who, who can answer these questions that I've, I'm, that I'm contemplating? And, and so Sagan uh, said, you talk to Lovelock. Lovelock's your man. He, he's, the, he's the expert in this area. So she writes him a letter uh, to, uh, to pose these questions. Unfortunately, that's, we couldn't find that letter uh, so our, our collection of 287 pieces of correspondence over just about 40 years of their, uh, of their relationship, it begins with his reply to her. And, and that was in 1970. So he, uh, uh, so we can kind of surmise what she was asking. Um, <laughs> But uh, he, he sends her a cordial reply, but still kind of formal, dear Dr. Margulis, right? They're, they're not on any kind of first name basis at this point. Uh, and and uh, so gradually they begin to uh, send uh, correspondence back and forth, honing in on Lovelock's hypothesis, Lovelock's ideas for Gaia, even though he it, it's not until about the 11th letter, if I recall, where he says, oh, by the way, Bill Golding says a, a name for what we're talking about would be Gaia. I'm going to jump in for a moment. So we're talking about we're talking about life all the way from bacteria all the way to the, you know, the, the global ecosystem. And there's a there's any number of striking letters in, in this book as I work my way through, but it really strikes me that this this uh, conversation about what constitutes life is a is a guiding theme. So one of the letters that I ran into, and it it's dated uh, mid February 1972. So it's you know it's early on in their correspondence, as, as you've indicated. Um, but it's this somewhat playful. I read it as a somewhat playful. <laughs> Uh, yes. letter that uh, Lovelock writes to uh, to Lynn, and he says, uh, you know, I'm quoting here, definition of life. Why do you distinguish biologists called descriptions definitions? I had the same argument with Norman Horowitz, my West Coast biological friend. There is as yet no definition of life, only phenomenological descriptions like that which is based on the self-replication of the right sort of coded DNA. So he's really drawing a distinction here between description and definition and uh, calling out the biologists. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what's going on here? What's the, what's the central issue at stake? <laughs> I'll let my philosopher friend take a first <laughs> <laughs> There was a debate at this time in the 60s, in the 50s and 60s about um, whether biologists need at all a definition of life uh, for their work. And one important role of biologists who needed at least criteria to distinguish life from non-life were uh, exobiologists, so precisely the people with whom Lovelock was interacting with uh, when he was at NASA. But I think the most interesting point here to note, uh, if you look throughout all of Lovelock's writing, is that you will not find any definition of life. So when you think about the idea that Gaia is somehow living, Lovelock is not trying to make a theoretical point to demonstrate that Gaia in some sort of way uh, corresponds to a list of necessary and sufficient properties that one would describe to life. What he 
what you constantly say is, is that one uh, recognizes instinctively living beings when one sees them. And um, wh when it comes to, to recognizing life, the, the most important breakthrough, so to speak, of the Gaia hypothesis was um, not to, to put forward a new definition, but to put forward a new object, a new living entity, which has yet not been studied, uh, which has uh, yet to be um, constituted as a scientific object. And, and this biological entity was uh, the total ensemble of living beings. I mean, evolutionary biologists uh, well, study population, uh, ecologists study ecosystem, uh, physiologists study the organism, but there was no scientific field studying um, the total ensemble of living beings on Earth. When did it start? Uh, how did it expand in space and uh, in space and time? What was the ecological relations between life, the, like the biggest entity uh, living on Earth, and its environment? So this was the research program, so to speak, put forward by Lovelock and Margulis. So, so it's, mo it's more an empirical question than a theoretical question about how to define it. So, so in in popular in popular culture and popular understanding, when when folks tend to hear of the Gaia theory, they usually associate it with the idea that the the Earth as a whole is a single living organism. Does does that actually reflect the views of of uh, of Lovelock, or is that a, you know a popular uh, interpretation that has gone in an entirely different direction? So, so I, I'll keep going a little bit and, and, and leave you the the, the floor then. Uh, um, so there are two, two, two very different ways to understand what they mean, or I mean, what it means to say that Gaia is somehow living. The most standard way is to understand it as a metaphor or as an analogy. The Earth uh, can be compared to a living organism or to a thermostat, which was another metaphor that Lovelock used because it has regular, regulatory properties just like um, organism or thermostats uh, um, do have regulatory properties. So this is um, the, the way to, this way the analogous or metaphorical understanding of the idea that Gaia is living as a long tradition going uh, all the way from the Greeks uh, to James Hutton in the late um, 18th century, one of the founders of geology. There's another, perhaps more interesting way to understand the, the ideas that Gaia is living is um, what I've called the idea of uh, a vital extension. So the idea here is to start from the activity of living beings. And when you look at all the metabolic activities of living beings, you will realize that their activities does not stop at their membrane or at their epidermis, but it, it, it expands on the material environment. And so much so that some things in the material environment which we thought were abiotic or purely mineral are actually constructed, influenced, built upon by living uh, beings. So in, this is in this sense that the, the atmosphere uh, is somehow um, considered as living. And there is this beautiful metaphor by Lovelock who says, uh, just like uh, the fur of a minx or the shell of a snail. So something produced by living entities. But the, 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 uh, comparing Gaia with an organism was, was something Margulis has never uh, felt at ease with. So there's a lot of fields coming together here. We're talking biology. We're talking geology. There's a lot of disciplines. Um, I'm curious about the scientific reception. So one of the, you know, in the book, you have uh, the collection of letters, which are wonderful. You also have a series of um, of essays that frame the letters and put them into context. And I want to read a quote from one of them. This is from uh, Peter Westbrook, who is uh, was based in the Netherlands. And he or is based in the Netherlands. And he writes, Gaia was in for a round of bitter conflict with the scientific establishment as it would upset prevailing relations of power and prestige. And that was precisely what happened. Geologists, biologists, and philosophers tried to dismiss Gaia from science. However, as far as I was concerned, their attempts were in vain. These colleagues lacked full understanding of emergence, a crucial system, systems concept, which ironically had already become widely accepted in physics. So I have two questions related to this, to this uh, quote, and you can tackle them in, uh, you know, in whatever order makes sense. But in my mind, first of all, is 
what is what is emergent? What is he referring to? And of course, it's a significant concept. But how does it, in fact, uh, buttress the the theory that Lovelock is putting forward? Um, secondly, we're depending on which order you take these in. Uh, he's speaking about the, the general skepticism of the scientific community, including biologists and geologists. Can you say a little bit more about that and what accounted for this degree of uh, suspicion and initially dismissal? Seb, you want to jump on that? Uh, okay, so, so I'll jump on the second part uh, on, the, on the reception and dismissal. So well, when you hear about the Gaia hypothesis, uh, you commonly hear that there was a controversy with evolutionary biologies. And if you look further into uh, the actual reception of the Gaia hypothesis, it's, it's interesting to see that actually there was no controversy with evolutionary biologies. First, because uh, the Gaia hypothesis was not proposed to evolutionary biologists. Lovelock and Margulis were, written, were writing articles uh, in journals of the uh, health and environmental sciences, not in evolutionary biology journals. And second, um, besides uh, 1981 and 1982, that is a, a very tiny moment where uh, you have critics from uh, Richard Dawkins and for Doolittle. Besides this very tiny moment, there is no reception in evolutionary biology. After that time, evolutionary biologists simply do not care about the hypothesis. But if you look at the scientific community in which there was a vivid reception, that is, there were um, special issues in journals, there were international conferences, there was, there was debate, interest um, to praise or to criticize the guy hypothesis, this community is that of the earth and environmental sciences. And in this field, Gaia had two very different effects. The first one, was to put forward the influence of life on its geological environment. And if you trace down the history of various disciplines, such as geochemistry, uh, health history, or climatology, you will realize that from the 70s uh, up to the late 90s, there is progressively a taking into account of life's influence on its environment in these disciplines. And you can trace down the, the, the influence of Lovelock and Margulis in this. And the second important effect that Gaia had in the AS and environmental sciences was to put forward a new object of study, which was named Gaia, and afterward it was named the AS system. And this what led to the constitution of AS system science, which is a, a field which uh, developed starting from the 80s to tackle the um, urgent issue of global changes. And it is also in this field that uh, you will then see, starting from the 2000s, new important concepts such as the Anthropocene or planetary boundaries. And if you look further in this field, you will um, realize the importance that Gaia had simply to put forward a new conception of the Earth, a new way to understand what, what the Earth is and how to study it. Yeah, so what Seb was just reviewing was uh, was actually the, the, the success of Gaia theory uh, in, in the fullness of time, uh, uh, leading to a kind of mainstreaming, but not under the title of Gaia, right? It's, which still had that kind of, no, we, we don't want to bring that mythological connotation into science. <laughs> so, and, and what we have nowadays uh, is, is a major cross-disciplinary research effort called Earth system science, okay, which is essentially Gaia theory uh, under a, a mainstreamed, non-problematic name. Uh, at least I, you know, I think we we would argue that that that's uh, actually how things happen. So uh, Peter Westbrook's comment, I think, is inflected from his personal experience uh, as a geologist, as a tra uh, traditionally chained trained geologist who very early on fell in with Lovelock and Margulis um, and, uh, 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 and then began to advance Gaian ideas within his own disciplinary milieu and, and got the kind of, the, I mean, science, the pushback that, that is perfectly natural uh, when you've got such a profoundly new overarching scheme 
that upsets many apple carts of 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 the niches of various scientific specializations um showing essentially that they're much too segregated they're much too siloed and so part of the overall change that gaia uh the gaia discussion has brought about is is a much more profound integration of of uh, especially of the um earth and environmental sciences so seb makes a, a crucial distinction because still that's a that's a particular set of sciences over and against the biological sciences and the most famous critiques of gaia were from the evolutionary biologists especially richard dawkins and they're prominent because of dawkins was you know was a prominent voice uh 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 but and uh and and expressed a uh, uh just couldn't see how natural selection could account for the evolution of a planetary level uh operating system uh that's sort of taking care of habitability altogether at the planetary level well that's a, that's a profound scientific issue um but uh uh, uh and and that became one of the more sort of well publicized critiques. Um, but Lovelock grappled. Uh, Margulis didn't really see that as a problem once you factored in the kind of the integration of life and in the environment. You there were pathways to move towards uh, uh, theories regarding how this. Uh, how these planetary level uh, 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 systematic or feedback effects could happen. Uh, so, and the other thing with Peter, you asked about emergence. Um, in a nutshell, emergence is an is sort of a name under which the, uh, the uh, an attitude of that that is critical of reductionism right traditional science follows is, is reductivist in that the idea has been if you can just take things and break them down into the, their smallest bits and then figure out how the bits fit together and then you can build them back up um then 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 you can understand how the world works and we now realize that that you just can't get to the totality of things through a reductivist method methodology. So emergence is a kind of slogan by uh, in systems theory, for instance, right? That 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 uh, and one of the uh, uh, I forget who it was, maybe Seb, you remember, who said more is different. So there are these like thresholds of when elements come together and fall into, I mean, just for instance, think of life. <laughs> life is an emergent phenomenon arising out of an abiotic planet, as far as we know, right? I mean, in the beginning, it was just, just minerals um, and, and with internal heat coming from the core and solar energy coming from the sun. And on this, and and in the midst of these abiotic forces, life emerges, and 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 all of a sudden manifests properties that that are not to be seen in in abiotic uh, it, uh, uh, constituents, and then life ramifies and evolves, uh, uh, and and so. Um, and and so we then we think of and then as life evolves, it also gives rise to systems like just for instance ecosystems. Uh, we could think of as uh, uh, as reflecting the propensity of living organisms to colonize, to cluster, to find symbiotic interrelationships that that conduce to. Uh, uh, greater 
survival value for, for the constituents. Uh, an ecosystem is more robust for all of its constituents than just as atomized individual living things floating around in a milieu. So that's what he means by, so he's sort of gathering Gaia and then he would say Gaia is an emergent system that arises from the emergence of life. I, I want to conclude with a, a question that looks at the, the process of actually creating the book. And uh, Bruno, I know you know you spent a year at the Library of Congress. One of the wonderful things about the library is that you uh, sometimes folks arrive and they think they're going to work in one archive, and then they discover there are many other archives and many, many other resources. Now, the letters themselves, as I understand it, were housed elsewhere. But tell us a little bit about what you found at the library, maybe anything that was surprising uh, in your experience there. Absolutely. Well, it was uh, it was a dream uh, uh, gig. <laughs> Hang on, got to plug my computer in. Um, it uh, it was one of the great experiences as an academic. Uh, 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 so, what I knew was uh, so Lynn Margulis was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in the 1980s. And, and as a matter of course, her, uh, uh, her work product uh, is, is brought to the library and archived. So, but uh, this, and so these materials uh, are, uh, you know, are, would be crucial to uh, someone doing a kind of history of the Margulis lab. <laughs> um, but it's not, uh, but you're correct in that the, the letters that, that Seb and I compiled uh, came, came from uh, Lynn's own uh, uh, file cabinets, right? Uh, uh, and, and that's where uh, Margulis gave me leave to make copies of, of the letters that she had collected from Lovelock. And then the other side of the correspondence finally got uh, uh, acquired by the Science Museum in London. And so uh, when Seb and I actually hit the ground running, we met in London to go copy all of uh, Lynn's letters to Jim that, that he had saved. Now, Lynn saved more of Jim's letters to her than he saved of hers to him. Uh, so the, there's a bit of a, there's just more Lovelock letters in the, in what we're able to find than, than, uh, than, than Lynn Margulis letters, but, but, but still, uh, it's, it's, a it's still a, a, a well-balanced, uh, there's enough of a balance that you can really get the, the overall picture of their interactions. Now, what I so when I went through the the marvelous materials at the library, I I found various items that were helpful in in uh, understanding the context of her uh, uh, conversations with Jim. But the thing to realize is that Gaia was not Lynn's primary research uh, program. Uh, it was it was uh, it, it was a side project while she did her primary. So most of what's in the Library of Congress it, from her lab has to do with her evolutionary uh, environmental evolution work on, on on the integration of biological and geological evolution. Um, and so, but Gaia is a perfect expression of of her biological interest in understanding evolution as, as more than a merely biological process. But once we had the letters established, in order to write this book, we realized we had to annotate them. We had to understand what they were saying to each other when they were talking in code or talking just using names that they mutually understood, but a reader would have no idea who what they're talking about or who they're talking about. So 
what I was able to do at the library was substantially begin and 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 carry out uh, uh, the the job of annotating the letters. So whenever so I would come across an item in a letter and I would go, well, now this seems to refer to some obscure publication that they're um, and let me just let me just have an intern run this down in the Library of Congress collection and voila, the next day I get this item on the cart in my office and, and I can now document, I, I can now make a uh, concrete identification on the, the document or whatever it might be. And, and so now uh, uh, this, so that's part of the schol the scholarly process of of annotating the letters for general comprehension um, uh, by both by professional readers uh, who you know who are scientifically trained, um, but we want uh, we want readers that are, are just sort of interested in Gaia <laughs> um, and interested in the in the minds. Of, of these amazing scientists, each in their own right, a brilliant, creative uh, 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 source of new ideas that's had such a profo profound impact. So hopefully uh, a, a general reader uh, who opens up our volume and kind of gets, wants to really get into the, the heart of of the of the conversation that they're having has has the information they need just to follow the follow the conversation. So my time at the library was absolutely crucial in and just giving me uh, both both the time and and the uh, and, and the research support and then just the uh, the the access to the <laughs> to to the you know more or less endless collections of the library to to run down these research research questions as they came up from letter to letter bruno sub thanks so much for uh taking the time to, to engage in this conversation today we covered a lot of ground a very rich uh discussion so thank you and congratulations again on on your book and again, it's writing Gaia, the scientific correspondence of James Lovelock and Lynn Margulis, published this year by Cambridge University Press. Uh, thanks again. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. See you. Appreciate it.